Today, we're going to explore the idea of buying a business and using that business's own cash as the source of the down payment. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Are you thinking of growing your business or beginning a journey into entrepreneurship? Take a shortcut to success by buying an existing and profitable business the right way. Visit businessbuyeradvantage.com and learn more about my online training, group coaching, and consulting services designed to help you win. All right. So over the course of several years, I've, this idea has popped up again and again in some of the comments on YouTube. And recently I had someone send me a question saying that they were watching somebody uh, talk about in a YouTube video, how you could use a business's own cash as a source of the down payment money. And so we're going to explore that today. And we're going to use an example that I found. And uh, we're going to talk about it and, and see if there's any credence to this notion. So first of all, welcome to the Target Co. balance sheet. So this is obviously a balance sheet that I made up for the purpose of this example. But I want to look at it here carefully with you. So we can see like every balance sheet on the left-hand side, we've got our assets. So we've got current assets here of cash, accounts receivable and inventory. So cash is $250, accounts receivable is 50 and inventory is 100. And then there's some equipment here in the fixed asset category. And all of this together adds up to $600, $600, okay? Uh, over here on the other side of the balance sheet is where we have the liabilities. So we've got some accounts payable. $25. This is the money that we owe to suppliers. <clears throat> and then there's a, a long-term loan here, maybe a bank loan for $150. And maybe this is money that was borrowed to buy these uh, pieces of equipment over here that are worth $200. And then down here in the bottom, we have our retained earnings. So this is the, it's the mishmash of original capital the owners put in and all of the past profits that have accumulated in this business that have never been taken out. In, in honest Honestly, the equity section of the balance sheet is simply a balancing section between the assets and the liabilities, what the company owns and what the company owes. Okay. So that's the equity. So, and this is 425. And so it adds up to 600. So the idea is that as a buyer of a company like this, you can get your hands on that cash, that big $250 of cash in the bank and use that in some way as the down payment to buy this business. So how is the strategy working? Well, um, we need to know what the value of this company is. Now, it's important here that we're talking about a share sale, uh, which is very different from an asset sale. And if you're not sure what the difference is, I have made a really great video called Asset Versus Share Deals. Uh, we'll put a link to it here in the video so you can go over and watch that. Um, and so we're buying the shares of the company. And when you buy the shares of the company, typically what is presented to you is a balance sheet of what the business will look like or what the target balance sheet will look like on the day of the transaction. And then you make your offer based on that. And what's important to note is that often when companies are being offered as a share sale, um, typically it's made with the certain terms like it's offered on a cash-free, debt-free basis, meaning that the seller is going to withdraw the cash prior to closing and that all the long-term debts are going to be paid off before closing or will be paid off in the transaction. So the, the buyer's money is going to be used to pay off those long-term debts. And there's a lot of important reasons for that, namely because the seller is often personally guaranteeing the debts of the company. And they obviously don't want those debts to carry on with the new owner because then their liability would still be associated with them. So we're talking about a share deal. And the other thing that's important to note is that this business has a lot of cash in it. And so uh, I've seen many balance sheets like this where cash is piling up. Maybe even they have some investment activity in the business. You know, they might own some mutual funds or some stocks or, or anything like that. 
Um, and that usually goes part and parcel with a high retained earnings. So what, what leads to this kind of condition? Well, you know, a lot of you guys who are watching are American and you guys have LLCs and S corps, which are like pass through sort of entities. And so for other people in the rest of the world, or for, for example, for C corps in the U S um, the company pays taxes on the income it earns, but then if the money stays in the business, then it can be used in the business without further tax burden. It's only when you take it out of the corporation into the owner's own hands that you then apply another whole layer of taxation. So here in Canada, for instance, I've met many people who've had long time profitable businesses, and this is important. This is why the retained earnings would be high. And they'll have huge amounts of cash and liquid, uh, liquid uh, investments and things in the business because they don't wanna pay tax. So they accumulate these earnings in the business, the cash piles up, it happens in the UK as well. And when these people go to sell, oftentimes they actually want to find reasons to keep some of this money in the business because often there are tax benefits to taking a capital gain on the shares versus taking the money out. So this leads me to my very first point. Um, oh, valuation. So we're also going to say that this business has an EBITDA of $175. And maybe in this industry, it's common for uh, businesses to sell for three times EBITDA, which would give us an enterprise value or a value for the shares of $525. So the enterprising person who heard about this strategy, they're going to look at this and they're going to say, hmm, what if I took $225 out of this company uh, somehow after I own it, and then I gave that to the seller, I'm going to offer them $225 down and the balance um, I guess in this case, it would be another $300,000 made a, or $300 made a mistake there. So, and the other $300 over five years with interest, that would be, you know, a 43% down payment. Like that'd be a very big down payment. Right. And so we go to the seller, convince them legacy, you know, keep the employees employed, all this kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to give you a 43% down payment. If you will hold a note. Now, in a lot of instances, if you have some kind of operational background and you come in with an op with an offer like that, 43% down with no bank financing and the seller gets like a first position lien on the business or, you know, because it's a share deal, maybe there's going to be a trust situation where the, the shares are held in trust until you make the last payment or something like that. Again, it depends on where in the world you happen to be. Um, that offer might normally be very enticing to a seller. Someone might actually agree to that. Um, but here's, let's think about the steps. Okay. So at some point you're going to have to convince the seller that your down payment is going to come after closing day. Okay. So maybe you anticipate that you're going to close this on the first day of the month. And by the fifth day of the month, you're going to give them the $225,000 or $225 rather. Um, and so at some point, they're going to realize that you're going to sign a purchase and sale agreement. You're going to have this closing day. No money's going to change hands. And then you're going to go to the bank and they're going to sign over a bank account, which has $250,000 in it. Okay. And then you're going to take that money out and give it to them. Does that make sense? Right. So, so here are the steps to this process. Number one. Find a business that has ample excess cash. Number two, convince a seller that the down payment money is going to come after the transaction. And number three, hope that they don't ask about the fact that there's this cash in the business. So, so what is wrong with our formula? Why are does it appear that this corporation should be worth $525,000 when it has all of this extra cash. I mean, just common sense starts to make us think that there's something wrong with this scenario. And in fact, there is. So a lot of the time on this channel, and a lot of the time when we're talking about buying, selling businesses, we talk about normalizing the income statement or PL. And we, we do the ad backs and all this kind of thing to get to the true cash flow. But very little time is ever spent talking about normalizing the balance sheet. And when you're going to do a share sale, you also have to normalize the balance sheet. And what we have to do is we have to say, 
does this balance sheet actually represent the normal set of circumstances that a company in this industry would have if they were operating, um, quote unquote, by the book or under industry norms? And this can vary from one industry to the next. And so um, I'll give you an example, right? Um, let's say that uh, a lot of bankers out there would agree that a business having a debt to equity ratio of three to one would represent a pretty good balance sheet. Okay. I've talked about debt to equity ratios before. So let's look at this company. And, uh, you know, if we add up the debts, $25,000 of accounts payable and $150,000 loan, and we compare it to the retained earnings of 425, what we find is that the debt to equity ratio is 41 cents of debt for every $1 of equity. But I just said, a good balance sheet would be $3 of debt for every $1 of equity. So this would be an indicator that this balance sheet right off the hop is not congruent with any kind of industry norm. It, it actually indicates that this business is overcapitalized. Too much money has been kept in this business over the years that probably should have been taken out in the form of dividends or payouts to the owner. Okay. So in analyzing this business, like if I were hired to do an evaluation of this business, I would need to normalize this balance sheet. And so I would look at the type of industry and I would look at what might be normal in that industry. And we'd be asking questions about, you know, would this industry generally have financing available for accounts receivables? What is the nature of the inventory? Is the inventory uh, fungible or non-fungible? So Fungible inventory, for example, would be like two by fours at a lumber yard. They're all the same. Non fungible inventory would be something like uh, dresses in a lady's dress shop. There are various styles, there are various sizes. They're not all the same, right? There's a degree of uniqueness to them. So it is easier for us to get bank financing for the inventory of the lumber yard than it would be for the lady's dress shop. And so what that would mean is that in the um, building supply industry, we could expect to find higher lines of credit supporting inventory levels than we would in uh, clothing boutiques, right? Because of the nature of what's there. And so this is important because when we multiply EBITDA by a factor, this recipe, this multiplier of cash flow gives us something called the enterprise value. And the definition of enterprise value is the value of the business as a going concern with everything needed to make the business, quote unquote, go. And that includes some amount of working capital. And that some amount is going to vary depending on the type of industry. And what it's referred to as is the net normal position in working capital. So you've got positive current assets and you've got these negatives, these current liabilities, and there's some normal amount, some normal net amount between the two that is part of what is required to make the business function. And without that operating capital, it's just like if the business was missing its forklift, like you just couldn't get the work done. Okay. So the question then is what amount is required? And this is where we get into normalizing the balance sheet. So in taking a look at this, and because I penciled this out beforehand, right, um, I'm going to take a look at this idea of let's remove, um, you know, some money from this thing. So what can we do? So number one, we've got $150,000 of inventory and receivables. Let's assume that this will support a $100,000 line of credit. Okay. So now I've increased this debt. Um, and let's say that I'm going to take out Oh, $225. Oh, sorry. So that's going to leave 25. Okay. So now uh, I've upped the debts. I've decreased the amount of cash. I've taken 225 out. Now my total assets are 375. And my total over here is too high because if I took out $225,000, um, then I need to take out uh, the balancing amount. Right. So this is going to be uh, taking out. Uh, this is going to be 300. Oh, sorry, miscalculated. Uh, 100. Yeah, there we go. So now you can see I've reformatted the balance sheet. I took out $225. I increased this line of credit by 100. And I decreased the retained earnings down to 100. 
And so now my balance sheet balances again. And you can see that my debt to equity ratio is now 2.75 to one, which is far more in line with what I said we were going to be expecting. We said that a strong balance sheet might be three to one. So this would seem to indicate that this business could probably function with this amount of capital in it. So what then does it mean? It means that the net normal amount of working capital is 175 minus 125. So there's normally $50 of net operating capital in this business. Well, what does that then mean for the other 225 we just took out? It's, it's called a surplus asset. So when you're evaluating a business and you look at a company, you figure out the enterprise value, that enterprise value includes everything needed to make the business go. If the business owner happens to own a sailboat in the corporation as well, that has nothing to do with the functioning of the business. It's a plumbing contracting firm that happens to own a sailboat, right? And he put his logo on the sail and he calls it advertising and he claims it all as a business expense. But that sailboat's got nothing to do with the business. What would we do? How would we treat that sailboat when we're looking at the value of the shares? What we would do is we would add the sailboat's value to the enterprise value. It is a surplus non-operating asset. And then, you know, questionably, the buyer may or may not want the sailboat, but that's for another day. So we have this excess capital or surplus capital of 225. And what we then have to do is we have to add them together. So what we find is that the true share value in this situation is actually not $200 or $525. It's $750. Okay. And so the value of the company with the extra money. So if we still had 250 here, and if we didn't have this line of credit, if we deleted that, and if we put these retained earnings back where they were, 325, I think. No, it was 425. Right, now it balances. So the value of this corporation with this kind of balance sheet is actually 750. It's not 525. And so it, what this is, is a little bit of an optical illusion, right? And so in order to get this to work, we've already said, number one, you need to find a cash-rich company. That's the first thing. Um, number two, uh, you need to find um, a, a seller that is willing to accept the down payment in a deferred fashion. So after the deal has closed and after they've handed over the bank account to you. So they've gone down to the bank, you've signed papers, putting you in charge of the company's bank account. Even though you haven't written any money, any checks, you haven't given them anything. They're going to hand this all over to you. Then you're going to be able to write them a check for the down payment. Now we're also relying upon the seller having no competent advisors who will become aware of this maneuver and stop them before it's done, right? Because if the accountant sees this, or if the lawyer sees this, they may not know what I'm explaining here today, but they may figure that there's something a little off about this. Um, and they may say, hey, we should go find people that we can talk to that might be a little bit more informed. So you got to find all of those things. Now, um, is this possible? Is it possible to pull this off? Maybe. I just gave you the three things we need in the deal. So if you can find those three things, you might be able to pull this off. Um, has it been done before? Probably. Yeah, probably someone has. And uh, that's probably how this got out there into the internet as an idea of what you can do. Now, is this a repeatable, systematizable strategy for business acquisition? Uh, I don't know. I think it relies a lot on luck. You have to find a highly motivated seller who's willing to sell their business for less than it's worth, ignore the advice of their advisors, and hand over the keys of the company without you giving them any money. Like literally, this is what it requires. Um, that's not to say that there aren't other things that can be done with a company to um, generate cash. For example, um, there was accounts, there were accounts receivable in this company. 
Now, a couple of months ago, I had Kelly Nelson on from a factoring company, and he talked about um, how they factor accounts receivable uh, to provide operating capital for businesses. So you could buy this corporation and then give Kelly a call and you could start factoring receivables that you generate. And, and then you could turn the receivables on the balance sheet into cash. So that could be a way to raise cash from the balance sheet. We also saw that it was $100 of inventory in the company. And so if you bought this company and you figured out a way to run it with less inventory, then you could sell down the inventory and then not replace that inventory. That would be a net generator of cash. We, we talked about some of these things during the summer of alternative finance, uh, which was last summer. And uh, we created a playlist about that. So th there are ways that you can take a business, change the way it's operated, and, and generate cash from that. But it's really hard to convince a seller, unless they are truly highly motivated, that you should be able to be given the reins of a business without paying them anything in hopes of giving them a deferred down payment. Now, what I have seen succeed, and I've actually done myself uh, in my own experience, is buy a business with a down payment and a seller note, and then have some portion of the down payment be deferred. So uh, there was this one case where uh, back when I was married, we bought a business and we gave a down payment on closing day. And then we had this deferred down payment, which was a special balloon payment due in six months after closing. And it was specifically because we were going to be selling down the inventory. Um, there was a huge back inventory of old dated stuff that had basically been written off that we were getting almost for free. And my ex had a plan for how she was going to push and liquidate that stuff, basically selling stuff that we got for free for full value and generating extra money. Uh, she wouldn't have to take any of that money and replace that old inventory. And so that was going to allow her to build up this special one-time deferred down payment. So, I mean, there are legit strategies out there, but buying a business and using its own cash for the down payment, it's... I, I mean, unless I'm missing something glaringly obvious, and please, I don't want to see a bunch of comments where you point to other people's videos who just yell about it and claim that it can be done. Um, show me a deal. Like, show me a deal. Love to look at one. Anyway, um, if you're curious to know about how you can buy a business in a risk-controlled way, uh, in a method that is repeatable and can be done over and over again, that uh, many people have done over and over again, head over to businessbuyeradvantage.com. You can learn all about it. You can learn about how I can help you. I've got an online course. I've got a group coaching program. I offer consulting services. Um, and with that, we'll say see you later. I love you all very much. Stay safe. Uh, don't get into trouble with your money. Um, yeah. Anyway, talk soon. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Go over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, and more. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go to Mark Willis at Lake Growth Financial, today's video sponsor. Mark helps people better manage their personal and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've seen others use it successfully for years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find all the interviews I've done with Mark and learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up for a free consultation to learn what this solution might look like for you.